everyone a special, a special hello to say a special hello to a special lady down in Tauranga. I see some Taurongarians here today, but I've just got a ringing feedback there, Alan. But I think you can hear it. And uh, Dawn, uh, we want to say happy birthday for a couple of weeks ago. She clocked 90 without a ticket. And uh, she's a special lady. She texts me every, every week, just encouraging Dawn Reed. She was part of our church, and she's down there now. And there's a few other roughnecks down that live in Tauranga now, but don't worry about them too much. And, um, and uh, she'll sort them out. So welcome if you're in the room. Welcome if you're online. And uh, would you, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just, I'm just excited to be here today. I'm really excited about the word that's on my heart. And Father, I love your word. I love what it can do. I love discovering new things. And uh, Father, even in verses that I think I know, in words I think I know, there's always more. There's always deeper, deeper, deeper. So Father, my heart today is that we will be changed by the power of your word as we hear it, because faith comes from hearing. Father, just bless the kids team as they, they minister today. Bless the bus driver. Father, I just pray your blessing on the setup team and the pack down team the worship team, the technical team, Father, they come, they work so hard to make this happen. And all to your glory to bless you. So be with us today. Change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've got a Bible, I'd love you to turn to Mark chapter 8, or if you've got an iPad or an iPhone or wherever your Bible is. And prior to the passage we're going to read, uh, Jesus is, he's just, he's fed the 5,000. There's a passage in the story um, where he feeds 5,000 people near a place called Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. And, th- and then we just get, and then he, he moves to a different area where he feeds 4,000 people in a very different area called the Decapolis. And there's 10 cities in the Decapolis, uh, primarily on the Golan Heights, really near what we call modern day Jordan. And Jer- Jesus did a lot of legwork, he covered a lot of area. And, and, and the interesting story about the feeding of the 4,000 is some believe that was a, a, a very much a Gentile audience. There's, there's a mixed um, bag on that, mixed feelings on that. Doesn't matter. He fed 5,000. He fed 4,000. Um, and now he heads back to the Sea of Galilee and he crosses over to the lake in a boat because boats are biblical. And the Pharisees turn up and they tried to start an argument with Jesus and uh, perhaps influence his disciples and they're demanding that he does some signs to prove who he is. And uh, so Jesus says, stuff this lot, that's the CRC version. And he jumps back in the boat, because boats are biblical. And he goes back to another side of the lake. And we're going to pick it up right now in Mark chapter 8, verses 14. You ready? The disciples had forgotten to bring bread. We've just fed 5,000. We've just, except for one loaf. They had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? It's always funny when Jesus asks a question. Does anyone realize why it's funny when Jesus asks the question? Because he... Do you still not see or understand? So now he's going into dipstick land, okay? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears that fail to hear? I've still got a ringing... Okay. Um, Do you not have eyes but fail to see and, and, and ears but fail to hear? And do you, and don't you remember? So this morning, all you have to remember is four words. Really only one, really. Remember. Say it with me. Remember. Say it louder. Remember. And don't you. Remember. They forgot to bring bread. They only had one loaf. 
When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? Duh, uh, 12. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? The seven. And then he said to them, do you still not get it? <laughs> this is funny. So I want you to remember the word. For everyone in the room this morning, I want you to word, remember the word. For those of you watching online this morning, I want you to remember the word. Remember. The year 2020 has been interesting. It's three, it's three quarters through. <laughs> the world has changed. And every year has defining moments and challenges, but this year has been tipped up. A disruption to our lives, disruption to our country. Uh, I, I got a, a friend at Air New Zealand, lost his job. He was flying the Dreamliner. I think 4,000 people at Air New Zealand lost their jobs. Um, disruption after disruption, countries shut down. And yet, who's ever felt they'd like to go deeper with God? Three, four. Okay, the rest can go home. <laughs> you know, you want to study more, you want to pray more, you want to, you're kind of praying, God, change me. And that's a really dangerous prayer. And uh, what I've discovered we often want to be changed, but we don't like being challenged. Yeah. And God, I want, to go, I want to go deeper, but I don't want to be disrupted. And God, I want to make a difference, but I don't want to be inconvenienced. And if you're willing to allow God to mold you, to do the things he's created you to do, to, to discover your purpose, remember growth track this afternoon, if you allow God to do whatever it takes to become all that he's called you and created you to be, let me tell you something, you will be challenged. You will be disrupted and you will be inconvenienced. Your thinking, your attitudes, new disciplines, um, um, time, cost. There's a cost to faith. So let me tell you, you, you serve a God that will challenge you, disrupt you, and inconvenience you. He knows how to do that. He's always done that. Watch when Jesus was on earth. He challenged and he disrupted lives everywhere he went. He even upset people. He offended people. He was always disturbing the comfortable and he was always comforting the disturbed. And that's what's happening in our reading today. He's fed 4,000 people. He's on the boat with the disciples because boats are biblical. And Jesus says, and the disciples say, Lord, we forgot the bread. And Jesus looks at them and goes, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. The disciples are like, hey, Jesus, what's that got to do with bread? The Pharisees aren't on the boat, Jesus. Herod's not on the boat. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And now this is classic Jesus. Have you ever thought how cool it would be to walk with Jesus? No. <laughs> that would not be cool. I think I would get confused as much as the disciples got confused. And sometimes those conversations, they're hard to understand. Who remembers being in school and the teacher's talking about something that you haven't got a clue and you're just nodding and smiling and yeah, I got it, I got it, and you are just clueless. <laughs> well, that's the disciples. I'll give you an example, a wedding. Jesus' mother comes up to Jesus at a wedding and says, Jesus, they're out of wine. And what does Jesus say? Not my problem. My time has not yet come. His mother says, just do whatever he says. And he, so what does the word, what's time got to do with wine? I'm confused. He turned the water into wine and the wedding got back on track. So now we're back on the boat because boats are biblical. And they're, they're talking about a loaf of bread. Guys, you are on the boat with the bread of life. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. What? 
What is yeast? Yeast is a fungi. So when you're eating bread, you're eating fungus. <laughs> well, that's a leavened bread. And uh, you put a tiny little bit in the dough and just a little bit of yeast will affect the whole loaf of bread. Yeast can be a metaphor for unbelief. Yeast can be a metaphor for pride. Yeast can be a metaphor for sin. If you're a petrol head, yeast can be a metaphor for rust. If you're a farmer, Bathurst, 14 more sleeps. If you're a farmer, yeast can be a metaphor for gorse or weeds. See, they just start out little, but they have the ability to take over the, and destroy the whole farm. And rust can just work its way and destroy the car. And he says, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. Well, in the context of what he was talking about, I think the, the conversation with the Pharisees had an impact on the disciples. And, and in another passage, it says, in other words, be careful of religion and hypocrisy. And he says, be careful of the yeast of Herod, politics, secularism, and worldliness. He said, don't start mixing yeast with me, the bread, because I'm the only one that can transform your soul. I'm the only one that can change your life. Don't start mixing what the Pharisees and Herod bring to the table. They're still confused. We should have bought more bread. <laughs> They're worried they've only got one loaf of bread. In verse 19, he says, When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? Twelve. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many did you pick up? Seven. And you still don't get it? These were two separate events. The feeding of the 5,000, very separate event from the feeding of the 4,000 a few months later. And the good news for someone today is that um, if God can do the first miracle, He can do the second miracle. And if you've experienced the miracle of God in one situation and you're facing another situation, the God of miracles can still do the second miracle. And so don't, don't allow the fear and uncertainty of COVID-19 pandemic to be the yeast to question the power of God. He did it once, he can do it again. Sometimes we need to re we need to remember what God has done in our lives and where he's brought us from. And I want to just speak for a moment to, on the feeding of the 5000. If I'm correct, the feeding of the 5000 is the only miracle in the scriptures that's in all four gospels. Along with the resurrection so that tells me it's significant. You can check me if I'm right. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. It's the, and so to me, that tells me it's a big deal. That tells me it's very, very important. So I need to dig in and look and see what I can learn from it. Amen? Amen. And it can teach me something and change me to be more like Jesus. It says to me, Jesus is not concerned totally with my soul. He's concerned with my soul, but he's also concerned with my physical He's concerned about my physical needs and he's concerned about your physical needs. So what you're facing, what you're going through, you need to know that Jesus is concerned about. A little while back during lockdown, we did the chill out series. And I remember saying in that thing, if, it's, if, if something's bothering you in your heart, it's already got the attention of heaven because that we serve the God of the miracles. If it matters to you, it matters to God. Doesn't matter how little it is, doesn't matter how big it is, amen? And Jesus is absolutely concerned about our souls and our eternity, but he's also concerned about my physical circumstances. He's concerned about the bills. He's concerned about trying to figure out how to pay them. He's concerned about the things that may cause anxiety and depression. Come on, let's talk about the things that we're not meant to talk about. He's concerned about the things that, that can cause that. He, when, so when Jesus is speaking to the 4,000, these people hadn't eaten for three days. Now that's good preaching. When you can preach for three days and you haven't thought about food, because some of you are thinking about lunch already. <laughs> it's, and it's a message about that God cares and God loves me and God loves you. 
And it's a mandate for Causeway Church, both as individuals and as, as a corporate body, that we represent Jesus in community. Agree? And I love what the theologian Howard Thurman says. The power of prayer is directly connected to your willingness to be part of the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Remember? The power of prayer is directly connected to your willingness to be part of the answer. Lord, will you just do this and get someone else to do it? In other words, God's not, not just looking for somebody to partner with Him to care just about the condition of their souls and their spiritual health. He cares about that and that's very important. He's looking for people who will partner with Him to care about people's physical circumstances. Let's look quickly at the two miracles, the 5,000 and the 4,000, and see what we need to remember. The first thing I noticed, that both miracles happened, there was a lot of people. In, in Jewish culture, they only count the men. So let's just guess, 5,000 men and women and children, 10,000. Just a guess, Okay. So we've got 4,000 men counted, then maybe 8,000. Let's just double it because that's easy to do the maths, right? We were in dipstick disciple mode at the moment, okay? And, and, uh, and whenever you have people, guess what? You have problems. <laughs> Don't forget to remember, as individuals and as a church, we are called to people. That means we're called to problems. They go together. Well, my faith is just a private matter and I just like being by myself. You got problems. (laughs) We're called to people, so we're called to problems. And right now, remember that we have the vaccine that saves souls. For eternity. Remember, we're called to people and we're not called to problems. In both miracles, here it is. Here's the kicker, man. I got so excited. Compassion was the catalyst for the miracle. Compassion was the catalyst for the miracle. In the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus was moved with compassion. Mark 6, 34. When Jesus landed in the boat, because boats are biblical, and he saw the large crowd, he had... Oh, that's pathetic. Stop thinking about lunch. When Jesus saw the large crowd, he had on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. In the feeding of the 4,000, it says to the disciples, Mark 8, 2, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have a long, come a long distance. They traveled long distances to, to hear Jesus. And when compassion calls, a response is required. God is calling you to have compassion and to do something. Recently, Anne and I were in Auckland doing something, can't remember, it was in level three lockdown. I think I went to one, one store, Bernsco Marine, and that was it, I was done. You got a sign in here, you got to walk in here, you can only walk in this direction. You got to go there, you got to walk out. I'm done, Anne, let's go home. We hadn't had lunch, it was three o'clock. The preaching wasn't good, so we're thinking about lunch. And, and there was this, 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 this uh, Maori man was sitting outside McDonald's drive through Really smart place to sit. And he had a sign, I'm hungry. Now, for all I know, he might have had a McLaren parked in the car park. Okay? But he said, I'm hungry and I'm called, and you're called to have compassion. So when we went in and then we were allowed into the shop and we we're only 10 people and oh, God. Um, two kiwi burgers what do you want two kiwi burgers for Colin I said I want one for the guy outside because that's their best burger amen (laughs) or is it the Angus should we have a survey (laughs) sorry guys we're just a bit loose today okay and I came I came out and I don't have to be the judge whether he was hungry rich or poor he just said I'm hungry I said hey buddy here's a Here's a kiwi burger. The biggest smile on his face. And I said, the reason I do that is because Jesus asked me to have compassion on the hungry 
and I love Jesus and Jesus loves you. And that was my gospel presentation for the day and we walked off, okay? You can do that. Eight bucks, I think it cost, or maybe 10. How much did you, you paid anyway? It doesn't matter because I'm listening. <laughs> Make sure you go to McDonald's with the right people. <laughs> Compassion is when care and action collide. Compassion is where care and action collide. In both miracles, compassion was the catalyst of the miracle. And if we're going to re represent Jesus, then compassion and action go together. And I, we've got some, some exciting announcements to make soon. We're just setting it all up, but I think we haven't seen the mess from COVID yet. We haven't seen the brokenness in our community and the church needs to be there ready to be the answer. Amen. In both miracles, the disciples were asking the wrong question. Who worries about things? Come on, just be honest. We're in church. We can lie. It's right. <laughs> Worry is the byproduct of asking the wrong question. Well, that's deep. This is good preaching. I know because they all go quiet. <laughs> Worry is often the byproduct of asking the wrong question because you're asking the question from your perspective. You're asking the, the, the question from your camera angle. The disciples looked out and they says, hey, we can't feed these people. We don't have enough money. It's in the text. Besides, where can we find bread? This is desolate place. Wrong question. I just want to speak to the couple that are risking losing their house today. Uh, um, this, this, this passage is for you this morning. Just felt it jump in me when that prayer request came. Matthew chapter 6. Do not worry about, uh, do not worry saying, here come the questions. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen, they do, okay? And I wonder if the reason sometimes you're worried is because we're asking the wrong question. What if there's another lockdown? What if my kids miss more school? What if I lose my job? These are very real questions. What am I going to do about the bill? How am I going to pay the mortgage? How am I going to pay the rent? What if the government raises the pension age? I'm starting to think about that one. <laughs> Wrong question. I'm not saying that we don't have wisdom. We do need to have wisdom with finances and, and management. But worry is often the byproduct of asking the wrong questions. And in both the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, the disciples asked the wrong questions. Here's the question Jesus asked in both the miracles. How many loaves do you have? This is really important. How many loaves do you have? Do you know the power of that question? Some of you know this passage so well. You know it backwards, upside down in Hebrew and Greek and French, but sometimes you miss things. I get a, a daily email from a friend in the States, Steve Grain, American ex-serviceman, ex-Vietnam. Only two guys in his whole platoon came back from Vietnam and one lives in Texas and they get together once a year. And he sends this little email out and then he had this, this big bleat, this big whinge about lockdown and blah, blah, blah and COVID and he was just going on and on and on. And then it's like he slapped himself. Father, I'm just so blessed because I can open my Bible freedom in this country. I don't have to worry about it. I'm not in poverty. I'm not starving. I'm not worrying about where my next meal. And you can see the whole, the whole little note he wrote just tipped right up sound because he asked the right question. And he started to look at a different camera angle. Stop focusing on what you do. Start, stop focusing on what you don't have. Start focusing on what do you have? How many loaves do you have? That's the question you need to be asking yourself. When you say, how many loaves do we have? That doesn't lead to worry. That leads to work. And this is when you find out what you're made of in the inside. 
Jesus wouldn't be asking for loaves if there weren't loaves available. How many loaves do you have? That means you have to do an infantry as to what God has given you. You have to do an infantry on what God has given you. And don't allow the enemy to get focused and consumed within with what you don't have or what you have lost. I'm looking at people and I know you've had some losses. Look at how many loaves you have left. They were in the boat with one. That was all they needed. You may have lost your job, but you still have your mind, you still have your health, um, you still have creativity because God's put that in you. And um, there's, there's airline pilots driving tractors. Just do whatever. How many loaves do you have? Here's the loaf of bread. What do I have in my hand? You see, it's easy to look on Instagram and Facebook and see other people's loaves. And forget what God has put in your hand. And what's on Instagram and Facebook is just doctored anyway. It's just rubbish. It's just the, it's just the facade. It's not what's going on real. Do you get that point? I thought that was a pretty cool point. Um, don't forget what, what's in your hand. In other words, remember. And some of you are sitting here and saying, where's the fish? <laughs> in my tummy. <laughs> Jesus never asked for fish. Oh, that came as a surprise to some of you. Go and read your Bible. Never asked for fish. That was a bonus. Can I tell you something funny? I was on a boat on Friday fishing. Well, I had to practice for the sermon. And I hooked a good fish. And I knew it was a snapper. Even though it was 60 metres that way. 55 metres that way. Because they have a nod. And you can feel it on the rod. And the captain of the boat said to me, Colin, are you sure it's a fish? (laughs) If he hadn't been the captain, I would have thrown him overboard. Now, I don't want to say who that was. (laughs) His name begins with M. This. What's this? Oh, okay. And just to make it more challenging, he only gave me 60 metres of line on the, ro- on the line. Cheap skate. Okay. okay. How many loaves do you have? In the process of looking for some loaves, they found some fish. Have you ever complained about what you don't have? Stop complaining and start thanking God for what you do have in your hand. Have you ever had a need, or have you ever, sorry, there's been a need in front of your nose and you've missed it? Or you failed to see it? Or you've seen it and you think it's too big? It's beyond me? Come on, church, we've got some big and beyond coming up for us in terms of a new building. Can I tell you, there will never be enough. There's people who have got everything and they haven't got enough. There will never be enough as long as it's in your hands. But God is calling you to take what's not enough and put it in Jesus' hands. And once you get it out of your hands, something miraculous can happen. You will never have enough in your hands because you're trying to be in control. And if 2020 has taught us something, you are not in control. You've got to get it out of your hands. And it said he took it and he blessed it and he broke it. 
can't hold the mic and do everything at the same time, but just imagine I'm doing that. And then he put it in their hands. The multiplication miracle didn't happen until it went, he blessed it, he broke it, and then when he put it in his hands, their hands, the multiplication took place. You see, if for Jesus had just done it all, there was no faith required. It started multiplying when Jesus handed it on. And if it didn't, if Jesus had done it all, the disciples, the disciples just would have said, Oh, it's all cool, Jesus has got this. He just, he just blessed it, broke it, and then just passed it out. Now the multiplication for both miracles happened through connection and interaction. And you've got thousands of people and you've got 12 disciples. Come on, Jesus, you've got all the power. You could just snap your fingers and we could have a McDonald's walkthrough. And, and how long did you think this miracle took? Doesn't matter how long it took. Multiplication happens with interaction. And here's my problem with the disciples. They'd witnessed the feeding of the 5,000. They'd witnessed the feeding of the 4,000. Why in their world would they be just stressing out that they only had one loaf of bread in the boat? Sometimes we forget to remember the goodness and the faithfulness of God. In the feeding of the 5,000, the issue was not the people. It was the price. And if you're going to do this Christian thing, there's a price. They looked out and said, where can we get enough? This would take half a year's wages. In the feeding of the 4,000, it was more to do with the place and the people. Remember what Jesus said, I have compassion on these people. And the disciples answer and say, well, everybody needs bread. That's right. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. I want you to use what I give you and take that bread to the world. I want you to start with Jerusalem and, some, and Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth right to New Zealand. Lord, will you help me see the people that I don't see because they need bread too. It's amazing how you can see people with addictions a certain way. It can be any addiction you want to choose. And then when someone in your family has an addiction, you see it differently. Agree? It's amazing for me, I can walk into a building and I'll see this building wasn't designed for dis people with disabilities. There's no lift. It's amazing how you can see children or adults with special needs until you have a special needs one in your family. We can look at things in a certain situation and not really have compassion or understand because we don't see what we need to see because we ask the wrong question. Can I have the worship team, please? Is this okay? In a moment, I'm going to ask the team, in fact, I'll ask the team now, the host team, to serve communion. And just I'll just give an explanation before I jump back in. So what we love to do is we, we pass out little, little trays of bread and little cups of grape juice. I just stole this one out the back. Sorry, Sandra. That'll do. He's got it. Well, I looked at you and I thought I'd take the camera out. <laughs> we need to see people with compassion and we 
Otherwise, we end up asking the wrong questions. And I just thank you, God, for the feeding of the 5,000. I thank you, God, for the feeding of the 4,000 because you know what he's trying to do with the disciples, what he did with the bread. He took it. He broke, he blessed it. He broke it. And then he put it in their hands and they multiplied it. That's what God wants to do with your life. He wants to bless you. He wants to break you. And he ultimately wants, wants you, he wants to put it, take your hands to be the bread of life to our community and beyond. So you can touch someone else's life. Compassion has a price. And the, this pandemic is not the time to go to sleep. This is the opportunity for the church to have its greatest moment. Because we've got people from generations coming after us. Can you start serving, please? Yeah. We've got, we got generations coming after us. And that's why you can't give up in the breaking. And don't forget to remember the provision of God. Now, if you're not familiar what's happening now, I just want to explain it really quickly. The team are handing out little trays of bread and juice. And we're going to partake in a thing we call communion in a moment. And if you're not familiar with that, or this is, you're not sure, or you're not a believer, just don't feel uncomfortable. Just let it pass on by. But simply the bread represents Jesus' body broken for us. And the cup represents Jesus' blood shed for us. So in this morning, I want, don't forget to remember the provision of your God. Don't forget to remember that God wants to take you. He wants to bless you. He wants to break you. And he wants to multiply you so that you can share who he is, the bread of life to the entire world who is hungry for him. We have a hungry world. Well, how do we get there? Jesus was gathered around a table. It's called Passover. It was his last meal before he was crucified. And once again, he had some bread and he broke it. And that's the little piece of bread that you've got now. And he said, this represents my body broken for you. And so this morning, as we take the bread, all I want you to do is simply remember. Because shortly after this, Jesus went to the cross and the nails went in and the blood was shed for you. So that our relationship could be restored with our Heavenly Father. So that we could be one with our Heavenly Father so that we could receive the vaccine for our soul and receive eternal life. And so this simple bread and this simple juice, he took a cup, he blessed it, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my name. Drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And that's what we're doing this morning. We're remembering. So in your own time, you take the cup, uh, you take the bread, and you take the cup and just remember and say, thank you, Lord, for where, thank you for my salvation. Thank you where I, you've, you've brought me from and thank you for where you're taking me to. Let's just take a moment.